Hello and welcome to Wellness Influencers, where we bring you the art and science of wellness to discover happier, healthier, and wealthier you. Here is your host, Dr. Kaveh Elahiun. Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Kaveh Elahiun coming to you guys live with another fantastic interview. We, today we have the lovely Kim Thorm Adams, and uh, she's joining us from Nebraska. We will be discussing some of the major topics for chiropractic care, especially when it comes to pre and post uh, natal and uh, children's care. Uh, Dr. Thor Adam, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Uh, I know you practice in Nebraska. Please uh, give us a little uh, snip of yourself, what you do, uh, how long you have been doing it, and uh, anything that you see relevant. Sure. Yeah, I'm from Nebraska. I went to Creighton University in Omaha and then Palmer, of course, in Iowa. Um, I did a preceptorship in California. Never did I think I'd come back to my little small town in Nebraska, but here I am. Um, I've been here, let's see, 10 and a half years now. Um, it flies. I now have two little baby girls. And so I just try to treat each patient as I would my own kid. Um, then there's no script I need to know. If I mask something, I just say what I would for my own child. Um, and I change lives and see the community get healthier. And it's really fun. Oh, Dr. Kim, I'm grateful for your time that you devoted for this uh, interview. So let's dive into it. Uh, okay. Expecting mothers, I'm sure you see lots of them. Why is chiropractic care essential for pre, before even they get pregnant, and post, after they get pregnant? Yeah, so to make it general, chiropractic is great because it allows your brain and your nervous system to communicate better, which then allows your body to function better and heal better. So whether you're pregnant or not, that's the general idea. But for specifically, if you're trying to get pregnant, you want the best function inside of your body. You want your digestion to be great. You want your muscle symmetry to be great. You want your hormones to be great, which are controlled by your nervous system. Um, you want everything to be as optimal as you can to make a home for that baby grow, let alone aches and pains, let alone make yourself as happy and healthy as you can so you give that environment to your baby. Perfect. Now, uh, nervous system is very essential, especially when it comes to conception. Uh, you need your optimal functioning nervous system without any intrusions and, and uh, shortcomings in order basically to make that uh, event very pleasant, especially when it comes to pregnancy. What are some of the cares that you do to for your practice members as soon as uh, you know they tell you they're pregnant? Well, I have a zenith high-low table. So the minute they're pregnant, I try to let that tummy piece give way when I adjust them. Not that an adjustment would harm, you know, a sack of water with a baby living in it, because it's a sack of water with a baby living in it. You're not going to actually pressure on the baby, but I just want to make them as comfortable as possible. Sometimes aches and pains will begin when center of gravity starts to change, which can be early, especially if the uterus has been occupied before. If this is their second or third baby, that center of gravity sometimes changes sooner. And they can say, I've been getting dizzy or I've been getting headaches or my low back is achy and there's no rhyme or reason. And so they just blame pregnancy. And sometimes that's a cop out to make people just live with the symptom and just say, oh, I have this because I'm pregnant. But if you haven't gone to a chiropractor, you don't know that getting adjusted can take that away because the center of gravity change can change all of the segments of the spine if it wants to, because something has to adapt to the change that's happening. Now with the uh, spinal manipulation and chiropractic treatments, what is it that we do that has such a profound effect? Well, we can stabilize the pelvis. So a pelvis should be symmetrical and the baby lives about here, right? When your pelvis is off balance, that's the key. It is off balance. It is not symmetrical. To give yourself the best chance at a wonderful pregnancy, at a wonderful labor, at a wonderful delivery, if you make everything symmetrical, the bone, the muscle, the ligament, the organ, everything, the baby will have the best chance at gravity, just allowing it to fall on down, their head down, so that you can have the best chance at a comfortable birth. Uh, I mean, uh, these days, I'm sure you have read in the different studies that most commonly uh, uh, pregnancies that go through a full term and then when they're having babies, the labor is done on their back. What are the consequences or what are the shortfalls or, or deficiency when it comes to uh, back labor? Yeah, so when the bones are out of place, when you're subluxated, when you need a chiropractor, it can allow 
or it can make labor to be more intense because things aren't communicating or functioning as they should. Um, gravity is really needed to allow the baby to just fall out at its best, if it can, if you will. Um, and when you're on your back, sometimes that gravity isn't possible. So I've seen videos of people having their babies at home, they're on our floors, they're even on the toilet, they're in the bathtub, you know, whatever you can do to allow yourself to relax, to let gravity do its job. Perfect. Now, once we have uh, the baby, now, chiropractic care, my own children, I mean, uh, I tell you a little story. When my first son, I mean, oldest son was born, I treated him about, he was about 45 minutes or maybe 50 minutes when I gave him the first treatment. And my whole paradigm changed when it came to chiropractic. It changed me as a person, as a man, as a father, and as a chiropractor and as a doctor as to how I looked at chiropractic care. So chiropractic care for children, what is the regimen? What do you recommend? How do you go about doing it? Yeah, so lately, a lot of my patients that are pregnant tell me, one, I can't go on vacation when they're due, even if they're usually like a week overdue, like I have one due the 30th of June, and I can't go on my 4th of July road trip like we like to do as a family, just in case she goes over. Um, so a lot of mothers are bringing their babies to me on their literal way home from the hospital. Um, here in Nebraska, most people have their baby in the hospital because there's a thing about having a doula and a state law and all that jazz. So typically, if you have it at the hospital, the baby's two or three days old when you bring it home. Typically, they honestly stop by the office on the way home. Um, sometimes if you have the baby at home or you're my friend, you know, I'd like to check the baby sooner than that. The youngest I've ever done is four hours old. And some people are like, what? You're adjusting a four hour old baby, you know? But when I met this baby, if you don't mind me telling a story, sure. the baby's breath was not great. It was like, oh, Huh. Like it just couldn't expand the diaphragm to take in a full breath and let out a full breath. And all, I felt it's fine. And all I did is a tiny little atlas, the very top bone. And I pushed it just a little. And, you know, it's like fireworks inside of myself when it goes where it should. I felt it fly away from my finger. And of course, you're not punching them like you would an adult because they're super tiny and they're super mushy, you know, but I felt the bone go where it should. I felt I felt movement in the spine. And immediately the baby's arms fly up in the air and he's like, <gasps> And the kids, you know, way older now and doing fantastic. So a lot of people bring me babies with ear infections. And sometimes I get frustrated because the longer you wait with anything, the harder it is to fix. So if the baby's on like their sixth or seventh ear infection was a recent story I heard, they've already had tubes. It's going to be quite harder for me to allow that tissue to naturally be as it should, because it might already be mad inside. Um, a lot of times people bring me babies that are crying for no reason. And don't get me wrong, babies cry, but they should cry to tell you something. If, if they're not poopy or they're wet or they're not starving or cold or they're lonely, you know, you want to know why they're crying. So sometimes they're just saying, ouch, take me to the chiropractor. So colic is a word. Acid reflux is a word. You know, um, babies should sleep well. They should wake up to eat and go back to bed. Mine, when they were about five months old, they started sleeping all night long. Sometimes they'd wake up once. You know, that's a regular, assumingly healthy thing to do. If your baby's waking up more than that, sometimes I adjust them on the second visit. The mom comes back and they're like, I thought something was wrong. They slept all night long like a rock. I had to wake up to pump. You know, I didn't know what was going on. Um, constipation is another thing, torticollis, you know. But now in my community, the, the mothers have been patients for a while. So they get it. They want their baby checked. I want them checked so that nothing happens. I want them checked so they can be their healthiest. I want them checked so I don't have to worry about this. And, and they get it and it's great. So I check my own kids, you know, every two weeks. Sometimes I don't find anything to do. If I tell they're, you know, a little crabbier or they fell or something, I'll check them more often. But I grew up getting adjusted. If you check it regularly, you assume that great things are happening to be as good as you can for the future. So it's it's based on the patient. I don't say every kid should be checked this often, you know, but if you come in and it's the biggest atlas I've ever adjusted in my whole life, I'm going to make you come back more often than I would someone with a tiny little thing. So it just depends on the patient, but every kid should be checked as soon as possible after they're born. Well, the, uh, I always explain to people who ever ask me about chiropractic care, and I always say it's part of a lifestyle. It's like <laughs> brushing your teeth. You don't brush once and say, okay, I'm good. I don't need anything. I don't need to do anything. My teeth are going to be fine. Our spine is the most mobile part of our body, and it houses the most important thing that we have in our body, our brain and cent uh, central nervous system. 
So, uh, you know, it should be a part of a, uh, wellness care and, and we all should get checked just to make sure everything is functioning properly because I always come often believe that if our spine was up front, people would have paid more attention to it. Than it was on our face, yeah. <laughs> so uh, with, when the kids basically start crawling and, uh, and standing up and walking, the pattern of their requirements and the treatments changes. Now, what is the most common things you see when the kids start crawling and walking? Uh, sometimes mothers notice that there's a hip hike or that they're kind of dragging one leg when they start, or even sooner than that, when they're rolling over, sometimes they prefer to roll to one side and they won't, just won't roll to the other, or even breastfeeding, they turn their head more to one side than the other. So the parents can see the lack of symmetry often, um, but when they are crawling and walking, they're going to fall and bonk their head. They're going to fall and land on their butt. And this is trauma, quite obviously, whether it's a lot or a little, that can make a shift in the spine to make them need a chiropractor. Mm. And uh, you rightfully brought up uh, breastfeeding. Um, I have had many uh, of our practice members who swear that every time they do get uh, treated, they milk flows a little easier and, and, and they have more uh, supply of milk for the babies. Have you noticed that in your practice? Yeah, I mean, not in every case, I can't go around and say, oh, you're having trouble breastfeeding, come in and I'll make you squirt like a Nerf gun, you know, but, <laughs> but yeah, sometimes there is a change. Um, I frequently speak at the hospital's breastfeeding support group and I do say that, you know, I mean, even muscle tightness, if they need a massage, if the pec muscles are tight, there's not gonna be a letdown. If the bones are out of place affecting a nerve called a subluxation, they're not gonna have full function. Um, so it really can affect it. And it's almost fun for me to see the surprise on the mother's face. You know, if you, if I don't tell them ahead of time, it might increase their milk supply. I almost wish I would have. So I almost have to in the beginning, just to give them a warning because sometimes it can be, you know, a half of a next bra size if it does come in when you're not used to it. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it, it's such a profound thing. I, of course, you mentioned that it doesn't happen all the time, mm -hmm. but it's one of the, uh, positive side effects of getting treated and being adjusted. Now, uh, speaking of uh, children, especially when they're starting to go through their, uh, you know, their walking now, they're going to start going to kindergarten and, and uh, grade school. Uh, why chiropractic care is essential for those kids? Sure. So when they start to go to school, the kids can share water fountains and they sneeze and they cough. So especially for my kids, I love checking them off. And especially when school starts, because the nervous system can affect the immune system. So if you want your kids to have the best chance at fighting disease naturally, to have the best shield, to have the best, hey, disease, I can encounter you and it doesn't even matter. You know, if you get the bones checked, if you get a find a subluxation to then need a chiropractic adjustment, their body can then communicate better, function better, and heal better. Um, a lot of times the posture in a desk, especially now that computers are used in grade school a lot, the posture cannot be favorable, you know, and that can make them go out of place. Um, sometimes I notice in my kids, there's a slight crabby or a slight fatigue, or even just a tone of voice because my kids don't really hurt often. They've been checked their whole life. But if I know what ideal is and what ideal can be, even in their nervous system and their immune system, if I notice these tiny little things, they can go off on a red flag or an alarm inside of myself to check them more often. Um, I have even a high school kid that comes in and his mom only brings him because he's crabby. She'll come in and be like, he is not smiling, adjust him. <laughs> and the minute I adjust him, sometimes there's this giddy laugh. And then he goes sometimes a month before the mom even says he's crabby at all. So it really can change behavior and personality and focus and attention. I mean, it all has to do with our nervous tone. And after all, it uh, literally regulates everything we do in our, in our daily life, our eating be behavior, everything we do. Is basically governed by it. Now, uh, that you brought out that immune uh, system, uh, it is very essential, at least uh, for, for my own kids, especially this time of year, I do adjust them a lot. I do them once a week, I check them on a regular basis. I mean, I'm home with them all the time, so it's easier for me. What's the effect of chiropractic manipulation on, uh, on immunity? 
Yeah. So like I said before, a chiropractic adjustment allows your brain and your nerves to talk better, to communicate better, like a computer inside of your body. When you have foreign invaders, when you have a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or mold or whatever's coming at you, you want to be able to have those shields inside. You want to have such good communication in there that things go where they should go to fight disease, that things are awakened as they should be right away to fight disease, that hormones, that responses, that all of these things are functioning inside of your body. Um, also, one time I learned, because I'm such a nerd at a convention, um, by adjusting the upper cervicals, like down to C three and a half, I think it was, you then affect the brainstem, which then affects the mechanoreceptors that live next to the mechanoreceptors that affect the immune system. So, you know, it's kind of like dominoes. By doing this, I then get this and then get this. Not saying that every disease can be kicked and that my kids will never get sick, because they get sick. But I can tell based on other children that don't get adjusted, given my natural health choices that I choose for my children and chiropractic, and I give them to sleep well, and I give them good nutrition so that they can have the best system inside to then have the best fighters and the best, best shield against disease. When they do get sick, you know, they'll get a fever, the body heats up to kill the thing that's there. When you kill it, you, you win, you know, and the time at which it takes them to go through this hump is not as long as I assume it would take them if they weren't getting adjusted well. Well, I, uh, my own kids, I mean, uh, it's not that they never get sick. They do get sick. I mean, they go to school and school is a petri dish of all sorts of viruses and bacteria. But the amount that of the time that it takes them to get over the illness is much, much shorter than their classmates. And when they bounce back, they bounce back fuller, much more happier, much more alive, if I can say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just it just works for them better. In fact, we went to uh, one of my uh, boys, the oldest one had an outbreak of some sort of a flu in their uh, school. And a lot of people didn't go to school, but he did. He went to school. The teacher was wondering, everybody's not coming. Why are you coming here? <laughs> He had told him that my dad knows what to do with me. Don't worry, I will be fine. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, there is a fear of disease, but you know, I grew up not being scared. I had the chicken pox in kindergarten. I remember it was itchy and whatever. Like, you know, I got a Barbie. That's what I remember about the chicken pox. But given society, given the media, given the stigma, there is a fear of disease. But if you see it as an opportunity to get your system stronger, as an opportunity to get a fever, to fight disease and to win, to then have a stronger immune system in the end, because that's what it is, then hopefully you're not seen as crazy for sending your kids to school. I remember when I got a call that there was chicken pox in the school. Your kid is not, you know, we need to call you and there's chicken pox in the school. And I'm like, okay, who is it? You know, like, I want to know. But there's <laughs> such a fear that people will then not go to school, even though it lives in the air all around you, assumingly, yeah. you know. I mean, in old ages, anybody who had chicken pox, say, in, a, in, a, in the area, everybody used to take and rush their babies to that person's house so they can all get chicken pox and get over it. <laughs> exactly. I remember my own mother dragging me through streets just to go to somebody's house because they had like chicken pox yeah, and she wanted me to get over it. So yeah. now with uh, treating uh, children are different than treating adults, obviously. And not many people understand that uh, spinal manipulation on the kids are done with a lower force and different methods and techniques. Could you be so kind to talk some about that too? Sure. I mean, sometimes it's similar. Don't get me wrong. If I have an adult that's not very subluxated, that subluxations are minimal, I use low force. You know, I, I be as nice as I can to get the job done. You know, and sometimes I get a two-year-old who fell off the bed or fell off the playground. It takes a substantial amount of tension and also maybe some force to then get them moved. But typically, yes, it takes less force on a child. Um, on my Facebook page for Dr. Kim, there's a video and it's got a lot of views. It's really awesome of me adjusting a little baby and he's supine the whole time. So I just use gravity and I feel his pelvis and I feel his lumbars and I feel his thoracics. And sometimes all it takes is me motioning him just like this and I can feel it fall, which is amazing. And then with the neck, in order to get it to cavitate, there's two points of tension that's typically need. So there's a laterally, the lateral bend and a rotation. And sometimes all it takes is those two motions without any force and the bone flies also. Um, so I never assume I have to 
hit them as hard, if you will, as an adult. But, you know, if you get a five-year-old up there, they might take a substantial, especially in the thoracics, a movement. I'm a big fan of the Gonstead technique. Um, sometimes a person needs a side posture, you know, and sometimes a person needs a cervical chair. If a baby can't hold their head up, they can't sit in my chair, you know, so we do as it is. Sometimes if there's a fear with the baby, I just have them lay on the parents and the parents on my table, that kind of a way too. Um, when it is in a child, I, I sometimes do a side posture if the subluxation presents mainly as a rotation. I don't want to add too much backwards force if you will, if it's mainly a rotation. So I really just put them on their side. I can hold their shoulders with this hand and the butt with this hand. And it's a twist, it's a gentle twist to get the bone to fall. But for anyone who's hesitant, I would encourage you to go watch my video. This baby didn't want to turn his head and immediately after the adjustment, he holds it in neutral for a second. Like it's an instant change and it's really cool. But you don't need that much force every time to get the spine to do what you want it to do. See, as chiropractic, what we are gifted with or we, the gift that had been given to us as a profession is touching and feeling. And our hands do the seeing for us. I literally sometimes tell my friends that I can't grab something hot or I can't touch, you know, very, very cold or hot stuff because my fingers, if I can't feel with them, that's it. These are my eyes. Mm -hmm. So as a profession, we're gifted with being able to touch and feel our patients and what's normal and what's not. Mm -hmm. The best part about treating uh, children is the response is almost immediate. Mm -hmm. And you can see the expression of you releasing tension immediately in their system. Now, yeah, I love when a tiny baby will give you an eye contact that you didn't know they had because they're looking at the lights and whatever, and you adjust them and they're like, I want to see the person that just did that to me. And they're so little, they can't talk. But yeah, it's even a look on their face when you've done it enough that you know you made a change initially. Now, uh, to, treat the, to treat the kids, one requires a certain type of personality, which I can tell you do have it. I mean, kids like to be funny, you know, uh, you should play and in a playing mode and stuff like that, which I do it. And I'm sure you do it too, because I can just see how uh, you are animated when it comes with the kids. Any specific pointers that would make us better doctors, especially when we are dealing with, uh, with children? Sure, so like to do an exam when they're old enough and they have reflexes, I use a reflex hammer, right? And it can also be a drumstick. So I have a little stool that I use to sit on if I'm doing a diversified adjustment because I want to sit for my own posture, you know. But if I get that reflex hammer out and we bam it, that's what we say, bam, bam, we bam the reflex hammer, you know, so they're not scared of it. It's not a doctor coming at them with a needle or anything. It's a reflex hammer and they bam it, you know, with me. And then I'll say, oh, can I try your arm? You know, and they're next to the mom. I do the exam wherever the kid is. I go to the kid, you know, and it just makes it kind of lighter. Uh, sometimes we talk about puzzles when they're old enough. You have a spine inside. It's like a puzzle. Your bones are like a puzzle. And if your puzzle's not put together, your body won't work as good. And then we find their puzzle. One time a dad was brilliant and his kid wouldn't lay face down. He'd lay face up and not face down. He goes, is there a turtle under her table? And the kid went, down and look for the turtles the whole time so sometimes I use that and I don't like lying you know and I'll be like one but somebody told me there's turtles under here but I can't find them can you look for my turtles and they'll lay on the table and I do my thing I'm like I didn't see any turtles I'm like I know I can't find them either you know <laughs> you just make it not a trick but you make it fun um like I said I have a zenith high low table so it rides up and it rides down sometimes kids want to ride it and it's fun sometimes they want to watch their parents do it first and they'll say mom are you okay oh yeah honey it feels good so that the fear is gone because really it's just fear it's it might be sore when it's bad enough that it might not feel amazing to get adjusted but it's not going to hurt a baby as long as they pass your exam and you know that you can then adjust them but it's the fear you got to get over um i keep pictures of me adjusting tiny little babies in my treat treatment room that way if the baby's scared or the young you know the young child is scared they can see the pictures of me adjusting the baby and know that kids much younger than them do it too um when they're real little you know they just lay there and they have no idea and you can do it it's when they start knowing what's up that you got to be pretty clever 
Fantastic. Those are awesome pointers, by the way. I will use the turtle thing because yeah. I do have some non-cooperative ones too. Yeah, yeah. yeah That's you just can't one. say that there are turtles because there's not. But if you're looking for turtles and you can't find them, that's a whole um, nother conversation. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. Now, uh, as a developmental, especially the first, as we know, the first few years of development is essential and quite pivotal for brain development. What is it that chiropractors we do to, uh, to, to facilitate better development, better uh, muscle tone, better uh, uh, muscle recruitment, uh, generally happier kids? What is it that we do that brings about that besides the yeah, adjustments? So so I'm such a nerd, you know, if you open Gray's Anatomy book, there's a chart and it will tell you which nerve goes to which organ and which nerve goes to which muscle and which nerve goes to whatever it may be. So even for adults, if you don't feel like you hurt, that doesn't mean you won't bring anything to the chiropractor because it does more than you feel. So in the early stages, when the body is forming, you want it to form symmetrical in the musculoskeletal system. You want everything to form as good, as fast, as thorough as it can. So, you know, if you have a garden hose squirting out water and you step on it, it might still squirt out water, but it's not going to be as good of a flow as if you took your foot off the garden hose. Same thing can be said with a subluxation. When your bones are out of place, out of alignment, enough to affect a nerve, that's called a subluxation and that's what chiropractors treat. Whatever this nerve is then going to, whether it's your kidney or your ear or, you know, your digestive system, it's going to be affected. So if 100% garden hose flow is 100% and any sort of even a millimeter change can allow and decrease that 100%, if you're functioning at 99, you're not functioning at 100. So you don't really need a reason. You just want the body as great as it can be so that you can then assume it will develop as good as it can. Perfect. Dr. Kim, you bring another lit up, uh, level of enthusiasm to this profession, which I'm very grateful for. Thank now, you. What is the routine that you do? I'm sure, uh, you know, you have good days and bad days. So what is Dr. Kim's morning routine when she wakes up? Yeah, so I'm usually in a hurry. I have an eight-year-old and an almost five-year-old. So the big one goes to school at eight. I wake up, I get the big one ready. I make sure she's happy, you know, as happy as an eight-year-old can be when they're tired and a little crabby, you know. I make the lunch. Then daddy, my husband, takes the big one to school. I get the little one ready. She goes to preschool at nine. And then I get to take her to preschool on my way to work. I open at nine and she goes to preschool at nine. And this is her last year. So to me, life is about love and I feel it the most. My bucket gets the most full from my two little girls. So as much as I can be involved in their morning routine, it really fills up my bucket and then it's full. And then I just have to get myself ready. Um, I drive to work and, you know, I used to be in theater a lot in drama. And when you're on the stage, you're on the stage. So it's not like I change myself when I come to my office, but, you know, there's a doctor hat. There's a different hat than the mother or me singing in the shower or whatever it is, you know, like I don't swear at the office office unless there's no patients here and I need to or something but in front of the patient I don't you know so it's almost like you step onto a stage uh, somebody used the hallway analogy once with me and I love it like if your kid's sick it matters but not right now you know if you're having trouble you know paying the mortgage it matters but not right now you need to be able to step into the hallway of neutrality put that in a door close the door and go help the patient Sometimes I'll almost stutter step or take a minute before I open the room, even if it's right when I walk in the door in the morning, you know, just to make sure my focus is there. And then mentally, I've been able throughout the years to zone out everything outside of the walls and only be focused on that patient when I'm in the room with them. Amazing, amazing. Truly, you're inspirational knowing how much and how many people you help and, and especially to the most... Uh, vulnerable on our future uh, to kids. It's amazing to see uh, doctors like yourself helping this community uh, raise more informed, better developed children. Um, now, if I were to take you back to the day you graduated from school, what would be the best advice you would give your younger self? 
to be more confident with it. Like you graduate and you're like, uh, now I got to go do it. How do I do it? Where do I do it? What do I do? You know, but you're given the tools in school. It's not like you have to go take a gross anatomy test 10 years later. You know what I mean? Like you use what you use. The knowledge is already there. Um, I almost wish I would have had my hands on more people and don't get me wrong. I got my numbers in clinic done early. I was able to go precept, but you can never have your hands on enough people, especially kids to feel confident, to rock an Atlas, if you will, without hesitation, you know, and that just took time too. And somebody asked me why I like to be a pediatric chiropractor and I'm not, I mean, I love the college football players that come in and don't think I can do it. And I'm like, lay down, here we go. Yes, I can, you know, but I like to treat everyone that I can. But when you start helping babies so much that the town starts talking about it, you get that reputation and I don't mind it at all. But the confidence is what came with time more than anything else, I think. Wonderful. Now, if our viewers, our listeners are uh, looking to get a hold of you, please let us know where they can find you, the website, the Instagram and LinkedIn, all the links that you have, uh, please share with us. Yeah, it's all on my website, Dr. Kim Thor, D-R-K-I-M-T-H-O-R.com. There's links to my Facebook that has the video of me adjusting the baby, Instagram, LinkedIn. I have a couple other websites and a blog that I hit up sometimes too. So that can even get you to my email, I think maybe, um, or just write me a Facebook message and I'm, I'm up for any questions. Fantastic. Dr. Thor, uh, Kim Thor Adams, thank you yes. so very much for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you on and hopefully we can get you back on in another perfect time for you. Thank you for having me. It was great. Grateful for your time. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye.